All right, welcome back to another Startup Junkies podcast. We appreciate you tuning in, however it is you might be viewing, you might be listening. Um, we appreciate it. Be sure to like, subscribe, and uh, catch up with uh, the cast of the Startup Junkies podcast uh, weekly. Uh, my name is Davis McIntyre. I'm joined today by Jeff Amaron and Grace Gill. How you guys doing? Doing yeah. great. We are ready for some March Madness. Hoping mm-hmm. the, the hogs will make it to the final four this year. So doing well. Fingers crossed. Absolutely. Fingers crossed. Exactly. Well, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest for this podcast, Blair Singer. He's a man of many titles, um, just to name a few. International speaker, best-selling author, trainer, advisor, consultant. Blair, how are you doing? Great to be here. I'm doing great. It's a beautiful day in North Scottsdale, Arizona. That's what I want to say about that. Awesome. I love it. I love it. But I bet it's a little bit warmer down there than it is up here. We're we're itching for some summer. Yeah, well, we're in about the mid sixty. Mm. Nice, nice for March. I love it. I love it. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself, Blair. How uh, how'd you get into the um, uh, speaker, author, trainer uh, industry? <laughs> Well, I, Davis, I wish I could tell you that it was by, by design and I had always planned to do it. It was nothing like that. And I think it's kind of the story of a lot of entrepreneurs because all of a sudden you kind of take a look around and say, wow, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> and then you have to kind of figure your way through it. But I grew up in Ohio. Uh, and after I graduated from Ohio State, I just wanted to get a far, as far away from Ohio as I could. And I moved to Hawaii. I was about as far away as you could go and uh, lived there for about eight years. And that's really where everything kind of started for me. I needed a job, went out and applied, got a job in sales. I was so bad, I almost got fired in the first two weeks because uh, our deal was they gave this is this was your sales training. Here's your business directory and there's the market. And here's the desktop calculator you got to sell. Now mm. you got six weeks to sell $10,000. You can do that. Then we'll send you to sales training. So that was my initiation into the into sales, um, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot. I learned that that uh, which are some lessons for us some other time. But that the real issue is, and this is the issue of entrepreneurship, right? It's not so much the customer; it's the battle. The toughest sale of all is you selling you to yourself. Sometimes, mm-hmm. right? and I keep Absolutely. going to make it happen. So went from there and actually ended up doing pretty well in sales. Uh, and started my first, my first business was a surf shop in Waikiki. And back in the eighties, that's when I met a guy by the name of the, that would later write a book called rich dad, poor dad. That's where I met mm-hmm. Robert Kiyosaki. Uh, we've been best friends ever since. And as you may know, I'm a, a rich dad advisor to my books or advisor books. Mm-hmm. Um, moved to Southern California, went to the air freight trucking business. Um, been several visiting air freight trucking business for about five years it was very successful it, it it summited it plummeted it summited it plummeted uh you know it was just one of those deals um and but i got in, involved in some personal development training uh really early in the 80s you know not when it was mm-hmm. popular and the concept that somehow i had something to do with all the good and bad things in my life was a pretty intriguing idea and so as I started applying it into business, I think it's the difference, Davis, is that my goal was, does personal development, because it made me feel good, but does it going to make me any money? <laughs> so if I could work these two together, would it really work? And it bailed me out of so many dire situations and it really worked. And people started asking me, how that, how'd you do that? And mm-hmm. I, you know, I'd talk for two minutes someplace and then five minutes another place and an hour someplace else. And you know, by the early 90s, mid 90s, I was doing this full time before I knew it. Work with great organizations, some corporate, big corporate organizations like Singapore Airlines and Morgan Stanley and IBM and L'Oreal brands and stuff like that. But then come around 2000, the, the idea, my affinity is still with entrepreneurs because that's what I am. And, you know, I was teaching sales and all that. And, and, and it seemed to me that I wanted to, I was one of those guys that grew up in the sixties that want to make a difference in the world. <laughs> My hair was a little bit longer. Um, and uh, I really want to make a difference. And I, I thought that, well, if I could just teach people this combination of business and personal development, that, you know, I, I make a difference, but the demand was incredible. I, at one point, 
there's I went around the world twice in opposite directions in less than 10 days. This was wow. doing on a Singapore Airlines contract. And it was like, this is crazy. I, I can't do this. So I shifted everything to say, look, I think for the next part of my career, if I can just teach people how to teach, teach people how to teach the way we teach, because I'm a firm believer that as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, you got, you, you're not just a leader. You got to be a teacher and a leader mm -hmm. these days, particularly more than ever. And so, and wrote, wrote a few books, as you mentioned, and that's kind of how I got here. So we have um, a training academy is in about 40 countries around the world. We got about four or 500 trainers that are either working with us, licensed with us, uh, do, doing great work together. And it's a movement to really focus on entrepreneurs primarily. Well, walk us, walk us through a little bit of uh, that process. You know, how, how do I get started and, and what is getting trained uh, kind of look like? <laughs> okay. So first of all, you got to have to have a, ideally you have a brilliant idea or you find yourself in a situation. So my first big, bigger business was the trucking company. I was actually went to work for a truck company that actually went out of business while I was working for them. And I was in Los Angeles and they're going to shut the whole thing down. I go, whoa, I'll, I'll take the LA station. I'll just, I'll do that. That was, I don't know what I was thinking, but <laughs> it was, it was crazy, but I learned so much and we turned it around and made it successful. So there's lots of ways to get started. Ideally, you've got an idea and a mission and, and you're clear where you want to go and to create a plan and build a team and all those, those normal things. But if a person wants to get started, I just tell people, number one, if you've got an idea, that's good. Number, But right after number one, you better learn how to sell because it is your primary skill. I see people with great ideas, but they never, they never see the light of day. They're, and they're technically competent, but they can't sell the idea. They can't, you know, and thank goodness for you guys, you know, your foundation and the stuff that you guys do, helping people like that, giving them a boost so they can, so they can live their dreams. So sales is a very big part of it. And that's obviously my background. Um, and I think the other thing, the, other, the third thing is to check your resources. You know, what resources do you have? What resources don't you have? And, and not be delusional about that. Be really honest. You know, I got a great network, but I have no money. Okay, I got no money. I got money, but I don't have a network. You know, whatever that is, that's going to help you build your idea because um, you're not going to do it alone. And one of the other reasons people don't make it is because they they go into business for themselves and they go solo. And they think that as a solo, they're going to get that one deal that's going to make or break them. But that that rarely happens. But if you got a team, you got a chance. Blair, let's let's zero in a little bit more on on some of the sales side of it. I'm I'm a firm believer that the the ability of a of a, a founder or a new business owner to sell clients and sell investors is really critical, particularly if they have to raise outside capital. In fact, those are two of the important criteria I'd use before I would invest. What's the confidence that I have that they're able to to sell? But what are the typical obstacles, objections, obstructions that you see when you get into a place and they're kind of sputtering and they're not making it? What are those sorts of things where you constantly have to help them to get beyond so that they can be successful in sales execution? Well, that's a great question, Jeff. You know, and, and I go back to my roots to say that entrepreneurship is more about, it is just as much of a personal development journey as it is a business development journey, right? And, and so a lot of times as a founder, as an owner, you got to look square in the mirror and, 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 and do I have the skills and am I willing to learn the skills? Or am I going to be arrogant enough to think that my product's going to sell itself? Or, I'm gonna, or people are going to love me and I'm just going to pitch a deal, but, but with no vision and, 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 and not able to tell to you know, I've never raised capital for my own business. Okay. I've raised capital for real estate and properties and stuff like that. Sure. But what I learned over the course of the time is that if, to be able to pitch the idea in a compelling way, um, in a way that gets, like you said, to get people to believe in you, that's a talent and a skill and it takes practice. Um, and I think that that's really primary. 
I think one of the obstacles that comes that comes to play is a person that is unwilling to learn. That is un that who's what I call their little voice gets in the way or their ego gets in the way and they're not able to do it. I think that's one. I think the other obstacle is lack of a team. They just don't have a team. They're trying to do this on their own and they're thinking that's going to attract it. Start with a team. Start your team will grow. You'll people will drop out and new people will come in. But you, you this is not an this is not a endeavor. And thirdly, is make sure you got some mentorship and work on yourself. Uh, these days, since COVID particularly, isn't these days um, tough for a lot of people? Sure. Getting locked you know, down. You know, you know, a lot of times we'll. I think it was Deming that allegedly said uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Now there's a lot of debate as to whether or not he said it, but it's attributed. It's not attributed to Deming. Forgive me. It's Drucker. <laughs> Peter Drucker said it, but, and he may not have said it either, but it doesn't matter. This whole idea of how important a team culture is, yeah. is kind of key. Yeah. What, what's your experience been around that? And how do you help your clients build a winning culture so that they can hit on all cylinders and perform successfully? Well, you're absolutely right. So let me let me tell you, I'll just give you the one tool. And I learned this from a mentor of mine many, many years ago, that the one thing in common, and you served in the military, you know this, is that something called a code of honor. And what a code of honor is basically, in my, my view of that is a simple set of rules based on the values of how we operate as a team. So whenever I've worked with an organization with, with Singapore Airlines or the guy trying to build his build his restaurant business around the block. The first thing we do is go in and and help them create a set of rules, a set of rules of how we operate, because it aligns the team, it pulls them together, and you use that and very you very commonly use it as a recruiting tool to recruit the right players. I mean, you know, I believe you served in the Air Force. I don't know the Air Force pays a lot of money. OK, I don't think that, and, and, you, and at some level you can put, actually put yourself in harm's way. But what happens is you're there because of something else. There's something there's a promise that you're going to become a better person as a result. You're going to get to experience a bigger version of you. Right. Sure. And, and you're part of a mission that's bigger than you. And I think that entrepreneurs forget all that. They think yeah. we're going to go for the money and we're going to go for the, you know, the technology. But I believe that, I, you know, I may be old school, but I still believe that if you're trying to build a team, that those are the core elements that will allow you to attract the best people, not necessarily have to pay them that much in the beginning, but attract the best people and allow you to grow. Yeah. I mean, and in follow up to that, to your point about the military, and, I, and I'm, I'm a veteran, my, my dad's a veteran, three of my four kids are, are, are uh, military members or, or, or veterans multi-generational type of thing. And the one thing I can tell you in our conversations with other veterans is that esprit de corps, that belongingness you have when you're part of a tight team that has a shared mission, a shared set of values, that is extremely hard to replicate outside of the military. Mm -hmm. It took me, in fact, I could easily say it took me 30 years to get back to that point. It was only in, in building Startup Junkie and some of the great people like Davis and Grace that I get to work with that you feel that again. Right. this belongingness around a shared set of values. That's not true in every organization. And that lightning in a bottle is very hard to capture. And once you do, you really got to enjoy those moments, that part of the journey, because that's not something that exists everywhere. So your point about that esprit and that code, that's really a salient point. That's very, very important, I think. Right. And I might add that I've not been, I've not been in the military, I've, but it was taught to me by somebody that was. Sure. And, and being best friends with Robert Kiyosaki, as you know, he was a Marine. And was, so so I've been around it a lot and it just became so comfortable for me that it, that I just can't, I don't I won't do business unless we can put that what you call that magic in the bottle, because sure. I think it's, it's possible to do. And I think that an entrepreneur that's willing to open their eyes to that can do the same thing. And I know Grace has been waiting patiently to ask a question. <laughs> you always Great say that. <laughs> um, oh, I was just going off of kind of what we're talking about here with teams and, you know, how do you find those people that kind of align with your mission um, when you're trying to build a team that, that, like you said, that can all partake in the lightning in the bottle or, you know, but you also are trying to identify pain points in a team and, and build a network that really can effectively work together, but also all has um, good chemistry that way too. 
Right. Well, I, I'll tell you that I think that one of the graphic examples when we built the trucking business in LA years ago, um, we didn't have a big team. We had about 40 people on our, on our team, 40 people on staff. And when we would, when we would hire somebody, even, a, even a, a warehouse person, the first thing we do is warehouse supervisor, pull out the code is written out, you know, about 10 rules and we go through them and it, he, and whatever his way was, he would explain it to those guys. And, and they either wanted to be part of it or not. Now here are the statistics on it. Long story short, we were paying minimum wage. Basically, these are warehouse guys. A lot of them never been to high school, you know, and all that. They, you know, some of them didn't speak very good English. But in an in industry at that time where you had over 100% employee turnover, easily over 100% employee turnover, we had less than 20%. These guys stayed with us. They work with us. They built, at one point, we were on the verge of bankruptcy of that thing, quite honestly, which is another whole story. And I was going to shut it down, Grace. And I, and, and, and I went to the group. I said, look, we're broke. I mean, our biggest, five biggest customers just went out of business. They're not going to pay us. You know, we're in debt to our eyeballs. I don't know anything else to do but to shut it down. And they go, no, no, you're not shutting it down. So my warehouse guys, these are small and tongue and Mexican guys, they're telling me you're not shutting it down. Why? And they said, they, they pull out the code. It said, rule number one, boss, never abandon a teammate in need. Whoa. Whew. I still get chills thinking about that, right? And so we, and we turned the company around. I was the wimp. They were the strong ones, but it was the code, the, the backbone of what we stood for that pulled us together. And we, be, we became very, very successful, even when we were completely broke, but, but we, we pulled it together and made it back. So it's, it's when you start talking, and these days of social media, you can broadcast. There's lots of ways you can put your message out to the world. And you're not that, you don't have to be selling stuff. Just be talking about it, you know, and, and, and to share with your friends and to share with potential investors. Share the vision and, the, as you call it, the magic in the bottle, Jeff. Just share that because it's refreshing for just about anybody these days. To answer your question, Grace? Yeah, for sure. So what, what do you enjoy about what you do right now? You've had, you've had this kind of interesting career and a lot of different things, but talk, talk about what brings you joy in what you do now. What, what causes you to get up in the morning and get excited about what you're doing presently? All right. So I'm going to get a little hokey on you right now. So I hope, That's you, all right. I hope you don't mind this. I, I, you know, like I said, I've always felt, wanted to make a difference somehow or other. And as I shifted what I was doing less from teaching people about sales to teaching people how to teach people how to sell, teach people how to become great teachers and trainers. And we have a very unique methodology the way we do this. Um, I got more joy. Out of it. And what I got joy out of is taking guys say, I want to do what you do. I want to be able to get on stage. I want to be able to teach. I want to be able to consult. I want to do that. Okay. I'm going to show you how I do this. And standing in the back of a room where we have 5,000 people in an arena and seeing two of my guys up on stage crushing it with Kiyosaki up there and his arm around both of them. And I'm in tears in the background, in, in the back of the room. Why? Because that's the dream for me <laughs> is, to, is to, it's to blanket this planet with the best teachers, leaders, and facilitators in the world. You know, because I think that right now, this is the hokey part, sorry, <laughs> is that right now our world needs it. We need leaders. There's a shortage of leaders. And a teacher is no longer just a teacher. A teacher must be a leader as well. And a leader must be a teacher as well. And people that are teaching principles, and te not, not the technology part, but teaching how to collaborate, how to communicate, how to work with each other, code of honor, that stuff, that's making a difference. And it's making a difference all over the place. So you can see I get a little lit up, about it, but that, that, that's, what gets, that's what gets me going. That's what gets me going. As you, as you think about what comes next, because you, you've got this thing, you've got a great satisfaction, you've had an awesome career. What's the next three, five, 10 years look like? Keep doing it. I just, I just lo I lo love doing it. You know, we go to, uh, I go to Kilimanjaro 
every year we, I take a group of my best, my best guys and gals, and we go there and we, we trek up the mountain and learn the lessons and debrief it every day. And what are you learning under in pretty harsh conditions? Um, you know, as a matter of fact, I just wrote a book about it um, called Summit Leadership. It's my next book. It's coming out in a couple months. But mountain leadership equals business leadership because the, the 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 harshness of the mountain and the lessons you learn in a seven day in seven days could take you five to ten years to learn in business. But it all comes together right there. And um, so doing things like that and giving people more opportunities to experience it, and um, I just believe that. Uh, the world's kind of in a state of a little bit of an emergency right now. And I, and I think that whatever we can do, whatever I can do to support it, I'm tireless when it comes to that stuff. I love that. I see, I see a lot of uh, attributes in you that, that we have over here uh, with Jeff and uh, being a leader, but not only being a leader, it's, it's being a teacher, you know, and, and uh, instilling these, these values to help our community um, and, uh, it's, it's, it's very powerful for sure. Um, yeah, it really gets that's, that's, that's a good point, David. So I think it was, um, who was it? Michael Gerber wrote the book E-Myth and he has another book after that. I haven't read it, but I read excerpts and one of the excerpts he says business, you know, in business, you're learning lessons every day, every day there's lessons every day. So business is a school, which I agree with. So that I say, if business is a school, who's the teacher? And that's, that's got to be us. That's mm -hmm. us as leaders. We have to now take the, otherwise those lessons just blow by and we don't learn anything. And so I, I have, a, and I have also a very close friend who started D, a company who might know DHL International. His name is Po Chung. He started in Hong Kong and sold it years ago to Deutsche Post. He started with eight people. I think he sold it with over 200,000 employees worldwide. And when we had this discussion, discussion a couple of years ago he said this he jumped on the bandwagon too he is what he said he said he believes if you're in business it it's a societal responsibility these are his words a societal responsibility to teach what you know to other people otherwise we don't move ahead it's got to be done and there's a way to do it there's a way to do it. it's not the way they do it it's not the way it's done in school school teaches you if you collaborate that's called cheating right <laughs> right and it, it, it's so and, and what we're teaching and what we're teaching is how to think for yourself how to find the truth for yourself you know and how to how to um and how to be a great teacher and leader so that's that's where i come. that's good stuff and then there's no there's no higher reward when you're in that role of, of educating teaching mentoring and leading of seeing the success of others that you might have played some small part in their journey it's right. the greatest satisfaction. It probably ought to be the number one measure of wealth in terms of a life well lived, because it means a whole lot more than any amount of money you could stack up for sure. Well, I tell you, you hit the nail on the head, Jeff. You know, you, I believe the same thing too. As a matter of fact, I tell my guys this, I go, you know, you, you're not going to be, you, you're not judged by how much you've accomplished. You are judged by how much your students accomplish. Yeah, you know, awesome. and, and if you and, and, and if you're not the kind of person that gets the satisfaction of seeing some, one of your students even do better than you, you're in the wrong place here because that's what this is about. And I and I and I totally agree with you. Totally. agree. We, one of the ways we like to land the plane and, and we as we enjoy these conversations a great deal is we we ask you to kind of put yourself in the time machine. If you could go back to that young guy that was thinking about starting this, the surf shop in a not terrible place in Waikiki and have the benefit back then of the knowledge you have now, what advice would you give your younger self? Well, I guess I give the advice I give my younger self, first of all, I wouldn't do anything different. I mean, I had some tough times, some really <laughs> nasty times, um, but I wouldn't do any of it different because I value all of it. It was all priceless. Okay. But if I were to give some advice, I would say hey, the first thing to do is to is to learn is to learn how to is learn a little bit more about finance. OK, <laughs> learn a little bit more about about financing and investing early rather than waiting until later, because in those days it was just like make it, spend it, make it, spend it, make it, spend it, make it, spend it. And that was that was not it. That was not a good thing. I think the other thing is 
is to know in the beginning that it is a personal development journey as well. That as you work on yourself, the money's gonna, gonna come too, as long as you're working too, right? But if you're only working on the money, you're gonna run into problems. If you're only working on yourself, you're not gonna make money. So the two have got to work together. And I think the third thing is just be prepared because you're gonna to need to be resilient because it's gonna change and it's gonna change fast. I had no idea. You know, I just got done reading Jeff Booth's book, you know, on the price of tomorrow. I don't know if you've read it, but he talks about technology and how it's at such an accelerating pace. We don't even, we can't even fathom it. And to be prepared for that, be prepared to use technology like you never used it before. So those are the, th those are my suggestions. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, where, where, can, where can our audience find out more about the books you've written, what you do, what's the best way for them to, to check it all out? Awesome. Thanks. Well, you just simply go to BlairSinger.com. And if you're interested in the entrepreneurial journey and how it can help, go to BlairSinger.com forward slash plan. And we'll just sit down and talk to you about it, see what's going on, see how it can help you steer you in the right directions, because we got tons of assets available from an educational perspective to help people. Excellent. Thanks so much for coming on today. We really enjoyed the conversation and, and best of luck in, in changing the world. It, it, you know, one, you have an impact on one person at a time or more, and, and it's amazing what can happen. So thank you so much for all you do. Thank you guys. Yeah, we appreciate your time today, Blair. It was a great episode. Thank you.